Welcome all. Hey, Karen. Hello. Your background looks nice. Thank you. 
trying to get a little festive, I guess. <laughs> I sent the Zoom link again because I didn't I didn't realize it was going to get sent um, automatically. <laughs> Some people got it twice, but that's okay. I wasn't sure. It will be right, right back. Dr. Gleb, can you hear us okay? Hey, Barbara. You're on mute now. Hey, Karen. I like your background. Thank you. <laughs> I'm That's trying awesome. to be festive. Like, it's really hard <laughs> There's when it's really warm. Hard to be feel like it's Christmas time. Mm -hmm. You're still muted, Barbara. I said I'll take the warmth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't hate it. I mean, it, it does. It's not bad, but like just snow for one day and then go away. Mm -hmm. We have 19 people registered. Yeah. Is this all right? What's that? I said, where are they all? I think it does say 12, so maybe. Yeah. Hi, Skip. Welcome. <laughs> Debbie, how are you? How are you doing? Good, thanks. Hey, Becky. Hey, Skip. 
It's nice to see you. You too. Hello, Barbara. Skip, it's nice to see you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Is, you, is, is Leah going to join us today? No. No? Oh. Did you hear she's going to be a speaker at the Samoset Convention? I sure did. I'm super excited about it. Oh, my God. I am. It's amazing. I'm so excited for her. It's wicked cool. Actually, yeah. one of the uh, one of my colleagues at Clear Rock is also going to be speaking. So uh, should be a fun day. Are you attending? Uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll attend. Yeah. And I'll see you there because I definitely have to go to see her speak. <laughs> um, I know. She this should be great. Um, yeah, she's uh, she's got so many irons in the fire. It's amazing. Oh, always. Yeah, she's a wonderful girl. Yeah, you did a good job. Thank you. She gave me the best compliment ever. She said, Mom, if I have kids, I'm going to raise them the same way you raised me. That's awesome. That's the best compliment of mine. Is that a compliment for you or for her? <laughs> I took it as a compliment to me, <laughs> but she did turn out good, so. Fair enough. Hi, Jill. Thanks for all the information this morning. <laughs> I I gave up on trying to sign up for that. Unbelievable. We got, what do we got? It's nine, ten people, nine people. Get a few more coming. Everybody ready for the holidays? I'm taking tomorrow off to do my Christmas cards. You never seem to find time to do it. I need to take a whole day off just to do it. I was going to say, that's really nice to take, to be able to take a whole day off to do Christmas cards. <laughs> well, I never take time off, so got to use it. I took next week off, and I they've already scheduled three meetings for me, so. <laughs> when do you go to Florida? I'm in Florida now. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, that's great that you can work from there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can't they see you're not available on the calendar? <laughs> yeah, except the, the acquisition team doesn't like to hear that. <laughs> what do we got? Oh, we're getting there slowly but surely. Give it just a couple more minutes. Another one. Rebecca, how's the running going? It's cold. <laughs> yeah, out there this morning. It was, but thankfully it wasn't icy, so that was good. Yesterday, yeah. I did not go outside. How about you? 
Uh, I'm fighting a little bit of a hamstring injury, uh, but I'm still getting out. So, you know, trying to find that line between uh, working it and overusing it, you know? Yeah, I'm finding that yoga on Saturdays and being in the pool a couple days a week helps too. Uh, I'm sure the pool is, is really, really good. Pool is really good. Easy, easy half mile. Unfortunately, I find myself uh, allergic to the chlorine. I That's sneeze all day afterwards. Yeah. Well, I got to figure that out. Maybe the sauna. Yeah. Yeah. Sauna and uh, nasal, uh, what do they call it? Uh, you know, I clean everything out. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go through our updates real quick before um, I introduce our speaker today. So maybe a couple other people straggle in. Um, I just wanted to, I think I know pretty much everybody here, but I do see a couple of new faces. Um, so I just want to introduce myself. I'm Karen Wyman. I'm the president of MCHRA um, this year and next year. And then, um, so a couple of things I want to go through is our new website is live now. Um, you can post, we also have a job listing there. You can post positions in your business uh, for free with a paid membership. So feel free to post there. Um, bear with me. I'm still navigating through the updates of the, the new site. So when I need to update something, it takes me a little bit longer, but we get the new, uh, the main um HR convention information is up there with the speaker lineup so far. Uh, next month, we will also be giving away um, a pass to the convention. So don't miss next month's meeting. Um, it'll be given away to any paid member that's in attendance in that January meeting. Um, we also have oh, our membership renewals. Ju uh, emails just went out, I believe this week or a couple days ago. Um, so those will go out, have gone out. If you did not receive one, please let me know because we it seems like we've had a little bit of problem with our mail going into spam folders um, and getting blocked. So I just want to follow up on that. Uh, we do have a few vacant board positions. Um, we need a president elect. Uh, we're looking for a membership chair and a website um, administrator. We're also looking for other members that can be on different committees, like a membership committee or a program committee. Um, so we'd love to, to see anybody there. And if you join the board, your membership is free. So <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, I think that was all of my updates. I hope everybody has happy holidays. This is our last meeting of the year. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gleb Sipersky. And Dr. Gleb was lauded as an office whisperer and a hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the future work consultant firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts, Dr. Glove wrote seven best-selling books, including Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. He published over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting-edge thought leadership was translated in Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages. Dr. Gleb's experience comes from 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies, ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Glove is a proud Ukrainian American who lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends an abundant of quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. <laughs> so um, 
to help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to come and share with you about how to avoid decisions leading to people disasters via behavioral science. So please um, give a big virtual round of applause to Dr. Glenn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for that warm introduction. And yes, uh, I'll be giving actually two presentations today, this one and then the next one. And then after that, I will be taking a walk with my wife in the lovely chilly air outside here in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. So let this, let's talk about avoiding decision disasters. So making sure that your people decisions are going on the right path and don't lead to disasters. We'll be focusing on behavioral science techniques and tools to do so. So first we'll talk about the specific ways that we can make decisions that lead to disasters. That's gonna be the first part of the presentation. The second part of the presentation will focus on how to avoid these problematic decision patterns. So that's what we'll talk about. And this is the kind of information that is not only going to be valuable for you, in making your own decisions, but for you to bring to your leadership teams, to bring to your operations managers. So really be thinking as we're going through this, how you will bring this information back to your teams, to your managers. What specific concrete tactics, techniques, insights will you be bringing to them? Now, the first thing I wanna talk about is decision-making with confidence. You've probably heard lots of times that you need to be confident when making your decisions, not only in work, but in other areas of life. So for example, driving, when you're merging, it's important to be confident and to speed up when you're merging. Of course, you wanna look where you're going, then speed up when you're merging, you don't want to slow down, that's a bad idea. Similarly, when you're getting onto a highway, you don't want to slow down, you want to be confident, you want to speed up. So thinking of that, would you call yourself an above average driver or a below average driver? So within that setting, within that context, what do you think of yourself, above average driver or below average driver? Let's see what people say. So please go ahead and vote on the poll. When evaluating your own driving skills, are you in the top half or bottom half of all drivers? Please go ahead and vote. Give people five more seconds. Show your thoughts. Okay, everyone voted, excellent. So we see out of here, almost everyone is in the top half. 92% of us are in the top half and 8% of us are in the bottom half. Now, thinking about that, how realistic is it, right? <laughs> if we should be, half of us should be in the top half, half of us should be in the bottom half. But that's not how it feels intuitively. And you know, in fact, this kind of survey was conducted in college students, 94% of them said they're in the top half and only 6% said that they're in the bottom half and they have much less experience than you do. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is one of the ways that our decision-making leads to disastrous. It's called the overconfidence bias and it can really result in disastrous decisions because we have a tendency to be way too confident. When we think about making decisions about other people, we had to be way too confident and jump to conclusions way too quickly. When people are 100% confident, studies show that are right 80% of the time. So you, know, you bet the house, you bet the farm, and you bet your career on someone. Well, you'd be right only about 80% of the time on average, if you think you're 100% confident. And in fact, this is especially dangerous for those with more experience and authority. There was a study done on doctors, so medical doctors. Senior doctors who were over a decade out of medical school, and then junior doctors who were just freshly out of medical school. And they were both given a case to evaluate and diagnose. And they got the evaluation and prescription of what to do right at about the same rate, both the senior doctors and the junior doctors. And the senior doctors got it right because they had more experience and know-how, and junior doctors had fresher knowledge just coming out of medical school. But the senior doctors were much less likely to evaluate the situation and reevaluate it and change their mind. They were much less likely to order additional medical tests. They were much more confident to jump to conclusions and stuck to their conclusions much more quickly. And so that speaks to the dangers of having more experience in authority and the kind of confidence that that comes with. 
So I want you to be thinking about where might this overconfidence bias be a problem in your own organization? Take a few seconds to write that down. All right. Let's talk about what's going on here. What kind of decision-making, why do we make these problematic decisions? Well, the thing is, most of our decisions comes from emotions, and we really underestimate that. We tend to perceive ourselves as being much more rational, rational, reasonable, logical than we actually are. So recent studies show that emotions drive 90%, over, even over 90% of our decisions when we do what comes naturally to us without using evidence-based strategies. So emotions like fear, greed, anger, anxiety really drive us without us realizing it. And we need to think about where emotions might be playing a negative role in our decision-making for ourselves and for others in the organizations and our companies. So take a few seconds to think about where and write down where might emotions be playing a negative role in your decision-making, in the decision-making of others in your organization in a way that's not really acknowledged or talked about much in your organization. Okay, now what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that our gut intuitions, our emotions, whether it's the overconfidence bias or other problems, have to do with being taught that by gurus that we should go with our gut, trust our intuition, follow our heart. Now, Tony Robbins tells us to be primal, be savage. Just go with what your primal self tells you to do. Malcolm Gladwell tells you to blink, in blink, to make your decisions in the blink of an eye. But that problem is that trusting our gut feels very comfortable. It feels intuitive, but it often leads to disastrous decisions because our gut is not evolved for the modern world. The primal savage gut is not really evolved for the modern world. It's evolved for the ancestral savannah, natural. That's when we were primal and savage. We had to have the fight or flight response to threats, which was life-saving for hunter-gatherers when the risks they faced were immediate, intense in the moment, like those saber-toothed tigers. That was valuable to very quickly to be overconfident and jump to conclusions. It was more important to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss one saber-toothed tiger. And so we evolved from those who jumped at 100 shadows and who successfully missed that one saber to tiger. We're the descendants of those people, not the people who didn't jump at the shadows and who were eaten by the saber to tiger. So we're the descendants of those who have a strong fight or flight response to threats. But that's dangerous in today's world because the risks we face are long-term, uncertain. They might come as notifications on our smartphone about a conflict with an employee or some anxiety or leaders having some inappropriate communications or something like that. Lots of people issues that we might not be thinking about and doesn't feel intuitive to us to take seriously. And in other cases, we might overreact to threats. So we might jump to shadows and jump to conclusions way too quickly and judge people from the first impressions rather than taking the time to really thoroughly investigate the situation. So that's the kind of risks we face in the modern world. And we face a number of dangerous judgment errors. And these are called cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are the specific ways that our mind is miswired, that our mind goes awry. And that comes from our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. And overconfidence bias is just one of these many cognitive biases that we need to watch out for. Now, I'm going to do another poll. Uh, hold on for a second, not this one. Did you ever make a bad decision? And looking back, you realize you had the information to make a better decision? Please go ahead and vote. Did that ever happen to you? Okay. A large majority of people voted. Let's give... A few more seconds to those who haven't shared their thoughts yet.
Okay. So taking a look at the poll, that happened to literally everyone. <laughs> it's good that you realize. Now thinking back, if we were logical and rational creatures, then if we had all the information we needed, we would make the right decision. But we're not. We have these cognitive biases, we have problematic intuitions, and that is a major reason for our bad decision making. And you need to realize that and face up to that. And so I want to ask you, moving on, I want to share something that a number of you might have been curious about when I started the presentation. Obviously, I have an accent. I look like a normal white mainstream American male, but obviously I have an accent. So lots of people want to know where I'm from, right? That's a common question I get asked often. And I'll be happy to tell you where I'm from. I'm from a small country of in the Eastern Europe. So my dad is Ukrainian, which is unfortunately all too known, well known by now. My mom is Moldovan. That's a small country to the southwest of Ukraine. It's so small, you need an arrow on the map to point to it. So I left that part of the world so my, with my family when I was 10 in 1991, when it was freed from Russian domination. And we came to the United States, and that's where I grew up. And I was quite happy when they left. It was a much, much better lifestyle here. And I was especially glad that they left in 1996. So when I was already 15, when I saw a world values survey that showed that of all the countries in the world surveyed, Moldova was the least happy. Least happy country in the world. I don't know why, but that made me especially glad that I left. So I grew up in New York City. And that's, if you know New York City, you know that's a cultural melting pot, very diverse, very different from where I am right now, which is Columbus, Ohio, much more homogeneous. Now, if I came to Columbus, Ohio, I'd probably try to fit in and as a kid, try to get rid of my accent. But in New York City, you walk a block, you hear a dozen different accents. And my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage, so I didn't try to get rid of my accent. And I found out later, that was kind of a dumb decision because of a tendency called accent discrimination. Accent discrimination. It's a perception that those with foreign accents are less trustworthy. Now, it's a false perception, of course. <laughs> it doesn't make anyone who has a foreign accent actually less trustworthy, but that is a reality in terms of a perception. It's, I'm not saying it's you, but on average, Americans have that false perception that those with foreign accents are less trustworthy. And that has to do with a pair of cognitive biases called the halo effect and the horns effect, the halo effect and the horns effect. And that relates back to another aspect of our ancestral savanna background. So we didn't, we, our survival again was very precarious. We had to survive in that ancestral environment as hunter gatherers. And we not only had to have the strong fight or flight response, but we had to have a strong tribalist response because we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, our tribe would kick us out and we'd die. And if we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, well, those tribes would take over our tribe and we die. And so as a result, we are the descendants of those who didn't die. And so we have a strong tribal impulse. So one of the ways it's expressed is the horns effect. It's like someone having little horns on their head. If you dislike one characteristic of someone, because it's usually because it's different than you, your characteristic, than something that is familiar to you, like accent, appearance, ethnicity, value sets, and so on, it signals that that person is not from your tribe, from a different tribe. Then you'll tend to have too negative view of their other characteristics. And the halo effect is the opposite. Someone having a little halo on, the head, on their head. If you like one characteristic, because it signals that somebody is part of your tribe, you'll tend to have too positive view of their other characteristics. And that's especially dangerous for business relationships. So if you think of HR, I see a lot of halo effect between other HR and folks within HR, but there can be definitely some horns effects toward others, let's say with operations, where line managers are trying to make decisions that may not align with best practices in HR, and you're trying to talk to them and convince them to make better decisions. And they have halo effects toward other people within operations, but horns effects toward HR. And that happens. But then other things happen. Like, let's say 
of sales and operations is another area where sales tends to overpromise and underdeliver because they tend to overpromise things that operations can't provide very well and the operations can deliver very well. So that's another source of horns effects within organizations. And that, of course, happens outside of organizations. So when we're thinking about hiring people and who we're working with, that can definitely be a problem. As an example, let me share with you my screen. And we'll check out a video. Now, this video was from a keynote I was presenting in 2018 in Columbus, Ohio to the local HR group, Hraco, at their annual conference on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So there's a whole, over 100 people in the room. And this is a, the annual conference on diversity, equity, and inclusion on a variety of, from a variety of companies, large ones like nationwide, city government, state government, lots of the small, medium-sized companies as well, universities. So all sorts of HR staff here in the presentation. And if you know anything about Columbus, Ohio, you probably know it as the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes football team. It's a really great football team, one of the best in college football, not the best, if I so say so myself. And we have a huge rivalry with the University of Michigan Wolverines. Unfortunately, they beat us this year. Hopefully, we'll beat them next year. And I'm ask, going to ask over 100 HR professionals in the room at the Central Ohio presentation whether they will hire a University of Michigan Wolverines fan. So it's the Wolverines. So University of Michigan Wolverines fan. Let's see what they say. Hold on. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go box, right? Oh, yeah. there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, three people. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> So that's over 100 HR leaders in the room who are passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Otherwise, they wouldn't come to this closing keynote. And you can see that only three of them would hire a University of Michigan fan. And it's not just an initial impulsive response. I gave them a chance to change their mind, and they weren't willing to change their mind. And so this is the halo effect and the horns effect can be a really powerful dynamic that can cause a lot of problems for not only HR leaders, but everyone else. And so given that, I'm curious, how valuable do you think it will be for you and your team to address the halo effect and the horns effect in your own work, in your own organization? Please go ahead and vote. You should be able to vote now. Oh, perfect. Everyone voted. Great. So we see that everyone will find it valuable, either highly valuable or moderately valuable. That's excellent. This is a great opportunity for you to take this information and share it with your team members and help them make better decisions. Great. Now, let's talk about another pair of cognitive biases talk called the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias. Now, the optimism bias is kind of like it sounds. It's people who see the world as how as full of opportunities and less full of less risky and much more rewarding. They see the glass as half full. They see the grass as green on the other side of the hill. And they tend to be very creative, entrepreneurial, opportunity oriented, but tend to be too risk blind. And that's me. I'm definitely someone who tends to be optimistic and fall into the optimism bias camp. By the way, it's not a binary, it's a range. And so there's going to be some people who are strongly optimistic, 
who are extremely optimistic, some people who are strongly optimistic, some people who tend to be moderately optimistic, some people who are moderately pessimistic, or if you prefer to call yourself realistic, you'll be moderately realistic, moderately or strongly realistic slash pessimistic and extremely realistic slash pessimistic. And these people who are tend to be pessimistic, realistic, the pessimism bias, they're people who are the opposite, who tend to see the glass as half empty, who tend to see the grass as yellow on the other side of the hill. And they have a lot of strengths, managing threats, stabilizing, improving, but they tend to be too risk averse. And it's very important for optimists and pessimists to learn how to work together effectively. Now, being a strong optimist, I'm the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and I have 20 ideas before breakfast and they're all brilliant. <laughs> well, at least they all feel brilliant to me. I've learned to my bitter chagrin that they're not actually all brilliant. And I run a six people company called Disaster Avoidance Experts. It's a consulting company on people decision-making and avoiding the people disasters of various sorts, training this sort of stuff that you're seeing me train right now and consulting on it. And think what would happen if I only hired other optimists. It's very tempting for me to hire other optimists because I click with them really well. But if I only hired other optimists, well, each of them would have 20 ideas before breakfast and we'd be reinforcing each other's ideas. And then we'd be running 120 different directions and the company would go bankrupt because it wouldn't be focused enough. Instead, what I do is I make sure to hire pessimists and I hand my 20 brilliant, so-called brilliant ideas to these pessimists. And they say, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, but maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And they're great at improving the situation, managing the threats of each situation and implementing them. They're not great at creating ideas themselves, but they're great at selecting the best ideas, evaluating them. Now, I'm a great writer. I'm not a great editor. They're great editors. They're not great writers. So that's kind of another way of thinking about this dynamic. So they select the ideas and they know how to implement them very well. So that's why you need at least two of each on your team. You need at least two optimists to provide ideas, creativity, entrepreneurship, risk-taking, and you need two pessimists, at least two pessimists to improve ideas, to provide skepticism, to provide risk management, to evaluate ideas effectively. And so I, when I work on to help teams figure out how to work together better, one thing I see is that optimists and pessimists often don't get along. They just have a lot of fights and conflicts with each other. And this, they just the optimists have a lot of ideas, but they feel really frustrated because the pessimists keep shooting them down. And the pessimists feel anxious about these optimists that's just shooting from the hip, being, and so that uh, being half cocked, they don't like that, obviously. So they have those, they have that anxiety. And so going back to our emotions, when we talked about emotions, optimists have a lot of frustration, pessimists have a lot of anxiety. And the way to address that is for optimists to be the ones who, to generate ideas, not pessimists. I mean, optimists are much better at generating ideas because they don't see the inherent flaws of each one. You know, pessimists might generate one idea to each 10 ideas by optimists. So optimists generate ideas, mainly optimists. Pessimists are welcome to do that. But then giving control of the idea evaluation over to pessimists because pessimists are much better at evaluating ideas. And that separates the generation from the evaluation and greatly reduces the kind of conflicts that you see between optimists and pessimists. If optimists are indeed able to hand over the control of their ideas, and pessimists then have the veto power and implementation power. So that's a much better balance. Now, thinking about this dynamic. How valuable do you think it would be for you and your team to address these two biases, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias? See, most people voted. Go ahead and share your thoughts if you haven't yet. Oh, 
Okay, again, great. Everyone find it valuable, either highly or moderately. I think a little bit less valuable than the halo effect and the horns effect in terms of proportion, but okay, great. Still over half would find, more than half would find highly valuable. Great. So take, take this information back to your teams to implement it. Now, I want you to take a few seconds now and write down where the halo effect and the horns effect and the optimism bias and the pessimism bias might be playing a negative role in your own teams. So please take a few seconds to do that. Okay, everyone, hopefully that was helpful. Let's go on to talking about overcoming these dangerous judgment errors. How can we overcome them? Well, you need to learn to go against your intuitions. Our intuitions were great for helping human survive in that early savanna, but not so great in the modern world. And think about other areas. Let's think about food. So the savanna environment, it was very important for us to eat any source of sugar we came across, honey, bananas, apples, we are the descendants of those who had a very strong sugar triggering response, because if we were didn't have that response, well, we wouldn't eat that sugar and we wouldn't survive and thrive and our descendants wouldn't survive and thrive. In the modern world, that's a very problematic thing because there's ultra processed foods, which is meant to trigger our sugar response. And there's a reason there's an obesity epidemic in this country. So if you're going, in the modern world, in the office, and there's a box of donuts, it's very tempting to maybe take half a donut. And then you don't want to leave the other half. Then you're already being triggered by the sugar. So you take the rest of the other half of the donut. And then you take another donut and a third. And before you know it, half the box is gone, right? Not that it ever happened to me. That's a problematic tendency for obvious reasons. And it's much better to skip by that box of donuts and go for the bowl of fruit next to it. They're much less triggering and much healthier, but it's much less intuitive and tempting. So hopefully you have worked out in your own practices, some habits to manage your diet, your eating and your exercise to have a good energy balance. And so you've managed that intuition, that gut intuition that you have to eat more than you should and I definitely have that challenge myself. It's it's definitely a triggering issue to have the donuts, right? You also need to learn. So you've taken care. You're taking care of your physical fitness, but you also, in the same way, need to learn to take care of your mental fitness. If you don't learn to take care of your mental fitness to make better decisions, well, you're going to get the same ultra ultra processed, highly negative outcomes that you get with donuts. Not good. One way to do so is with assessment and dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. This is a great tool to focus on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings. It helps you value their extent and impact in your workplace and provides the next steps for addressing these problems. I'm going to share my screen again so that you could see what it's like. And for this purpose, we'll be using the chat feature. So please make sure to open up your chat feature. So take a look at the directions. The assessment questions refer to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. You want to indicate how often it occurred in the past year in the terms of percentage terms out of all the possible times that the problem might have occurred. So think about your own context on when you're doing this. Don't overthink. It doesn't have to be precise. Each question should take you 15 to 20 seconds. So first question, put your answer in the chat. What percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget? 
in your workplace that you are quite comfortable and familiar with in the last year? So please go ahead and vote. That's the question number one. Share your answer in the chat. There's 90%, 75%, 0%, 30%, 50%. I'm impressed by the 0%. That's unusual. 50%. Other folks? 10%, 30%. 30%. So we see a whole range of answers from 0 to 95%, 20%. If it's kind of 0, 5%, 10%, it's just normal variance, randomness, chance, not too big a deal. It's getting into the 15% range, 20% that's becoming more of a serious issue. If it's getting over 20, that's becoming a really serious issue because it means that there's a misallocation of resources and not so great planning. And this has to do with cognitive bias called the planning fallacy, where when we make a plan, we feel like everything will go according to plan. But often, of course, it will not. So that is something that we need to learn about. You've probably heard the phrase, failing to plan is planning to fail. And that's kind of a misleading phrase because, again, it implies that if you make a plan, everything will go well. A much more effective phrase is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. That's something that's much more effective. Oh. Of all situations, when someone had the evidence that would contradict their beliefs or clear information that would disprove their interpretation of the situation, in what percentage of the cases did they ignore the evidence or misinterpret the information? in the past year. So please go ahead. So you had information that you needed to make a better decision, but you misinterpreted it. Somebody else misinterpreted it. So that is 40%, 20%, 10%, 10%, Other folks, 15%, 20%, 20%. So this is called the confirmation bias, 40%, where we tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that disproves our beliefs. And that's a big problem I see in professional situations all the time that leads to bad decision-making around other people. And there's gonna be 28 more questions like this. So all of these questions, you don't, as you can see from the question, you don't need to know the actual cognitive bias that underlines it in order to answer it. This is very helpful for you to take yourself, then also bring back to your team and have them take it for everyone to learn about these cognitive biases. So that's the, kind of the first step of addressing these problems, learning about them in the assessment. So that is going to be a very helpful tool. Now, thinking about that, how valuable would it be for you and your team to take this assessment to address the cognitive biases it uncovers? Please go ahead. See, most people voted. Let's give five more seconds for those who haven't voted yet. Okay, so you see, so everyone would still find it valuable, but a little bit less valuable than the optimism bias and the pessimism bias concept than the halo effect and the horns effect. So I recommend that you take it yourself and then to the extent that you find it valuable, then you would want to share it with your team members. Excellent. Let's go on to a tool that's going to be very helpful for you. So that's about knowing about the problems, but how do you address the problems? So here's a tool that's very helpful, it takes only a couple of minutes to do to address problems on any decision you don't want to screw up. It's five questions to avoid decision disaster. So it's very helpful for you to ask this when you're thinking about a people decision or any other decision, but focusing on people decision that you don't want to screw up when you're assessing others, when you're writing an important message, when you're thinking about preparing for a meeting, make, making even making a hire, making sure that you make the right decision and avoid decision disasters. What important information didn't I yet fully consider is the first of the five questions you want to ask. We tend to not fully consider information that goes against our beliefs, that goes against our intuitions. 
So you want to, typically what we do is we make a business case for something. We try to prove that we are right. That's great for convincing other people, but it's not so helpful for making the right decision. So you want to instead try to disconfirm yourself, try to prove yourself wrong. And that's a much more helpful approach to making the right decision. Now you also want to look for information that's important. So don't get stuck in analysis paralysis. Don't look for all information. Decide what information is important and focus on that. What dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? Whether it's the confirmation bias, the planning fallacy, whether it's the optimism bias, the pessimism bias, halo effect, horns effect, overconfidence bias, or any of the other cognitive biases that you learn about in the assessment, the conclusion, the appendix to the assessment has all the biases that, under, that underpin each question. You can use that once you learn about it to quickly answer this question. What would a trust and objective advisor suggest I do? So what would that little angel on your shoulder suggest you do? Think about, let's say, board members of MCHRA. Think about your consultants or executive coaches who you trust, maybe some other me peers, mentors who you trust. How would they help you answer this question? And maybe give them a call. Okay, we're transitioning from making the right decision to implementing it, because even if you make the right decision well, if you don't implement it well, you will not succeed. How have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about failure here. How have you addressed all the ways that the decision that you're making can actually go awry? And try to prevent these potential failure with states in advance. And what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? So what can cause you to change your mind about this? We tend to become fixed once we make a decision. It's called post-factum rationalization. And we tend to not change our mind when we should, as new evidence comes to light. In, but what's very helpful is to decide in advance that, hey, this new information will cause me to revise my perspective on this decision. And if we decide that in advance, then we're much more open to changing our mind. So let's go through this, how it might work with making a hire. What important information didn't I yet fully consider? One of the ways I often see this go wrong with a hire is that people don't call references. References can be extremely helpful. And there are questions that you can ask that someone who is a reference, well, they think that they'll just give puffy answers and that won't be helpful. But you can ask questions that the reference can't give just a puffy, hyped up answer to. For example, you can ask, what culture would this person fit in well with? Everyone has a different culture. So if you ask that question, they don't describe your culture, that's a good sign that that's not a great fit. Next, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? So here, if you are an optimist, you might be too optimistic. If you're a pessimist, you might be too pessimistic. Maybe with a halo effect, maybe this is a person who went to the same college that you did or has the same accent, and that might be a problem that would cause you to be predisposed to this person. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? Give someone, talk to someone else who's not involved in the hire and give them your perspective on the potential applicants and their fit for the role and see what they say, what they think. How have I addressed the ways this could fail? So once you're making a hire, how have you addressed the ways this can fail? One way I see new hires failing is not fitting into the organization. So you can give them a good mentor one mentor from their own team, one mentor from outside their team to both help them fit into their team and the ways that the team works and then help them fit more broadly into the organization and build a contact network. And then what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? You can have 360 degree reviews with the five people having those reviews with the five people this person speaks to most often, interacts with most often, at the 30, 60, and 90 day mark. So have an interview with each of these people about how this person is doing, and then give that person summary feedback at the 30, 60, and 90 day mark. And that's very helpful because at the 30 day mark, you could still make a number of changes. This person can improve the same thing at the 60 day mark, and then you can make a final decision at the 90 day mark. And that's an approach that you can take with as major a question as a hire, but you can also take it with questions like writing an email to a client, having a performance evaluation, doing conflict resolution, all sorts of questions, implementing a new system, HR system, CRM or something like that. There are lots of questions that you can use this for. 
And it's great for team decision making as well, because what you want to do is when you're having a team decision making meeting, you want everyone to answer the questions in advance and write them down. And then at the team decision making meeting, everyone just goes around the room, reads their answer to the first question, and then you just discuss it, come to some sort of a consensus and then move on. You are much less likely to make a bad decision and the meeting is much, much quicker. I can guarantee that from the, what the previous types of meeting on decision making would be. Thinking about this question, how valuable would it be for you and your team to use the five questions to make good enough decisions? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, most people voted. Five more seconds for the one person who hasn't voted yet. Great, thank you. Okay, so this is going to be more popular than the assessment. That's great. So this is an opportunity for you to start taking these questions and implementing them in your own decision-making and send them to your team. Okay, so three additional resources. If you're watching this after the presentation, go to tanyarol.com forward slash DAE event and you'll get the resources. So again, if you're watching them as a recording after the presentation, go to tanyarol.com forward slash DAE event to get the resources. But otherwise, I'll send them to you. The assessment on dangerous judgment errors, the decision aid and five key questions, and a copy of my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, as well as the copy of my slides. And I'll be happy to have a free coaching session with the first three claimants. So first, there I have three sessions available, so first come, first served. Okay, everyone, I'll be happy to take any questions at this stage. You can unmute yourself or you can ask in the chat, whatever is comfortable for you. Uh, thanks for that great presentation. I um, I really like uh, assessment tools. And, uh, you know, this one's focused on uh, judgments and biases. Do you have any other assessment tools that you would recommend uh, to help uh, a team develop good group process? Hmm. Great question. I don't have any specific tools for good group process that I'm comfortable enough recommending, but thank you for okay. asking that. Yep. Okay. Other folks. How about a handy list of those 30 biases? That's going to be, yep, that's going to be an assessment. So the assessment will be, uh, the end of the assessment will have the list of biases, their definitions, and you will see the tie into each question. Yep. So that's going to be an appendix to the assessment. Um, when would you apply these during the onboarding process or interview process for new candidates to get a feel for their biases? Mm. So you definitely want to, have them first be on boarded and have them have the information about what the organization is like. So probably something like a couple of weeks into it would be my uh, recommendation. And so that it would be a good stage to apply them in. Thank you. You're welcome, Judy. I really like the simple illustration that you did, like with uh, the overconfidence bias around, are you mm -hmm. a good driver above average or below average? Uh, do you have uh, any recommendations on uh, other sort of easy illustrations to use in a, a team building event or to help bring some of these points home? I do. Oh, thank you for the question, Skip. Let me 
share with you. Uh, hold on. So this is going to be a video. Okay. Uh, so I should be able, you should be able to hear it now. So you'll, your goal will be to count the number of times that the players wearing white pass the ball. So check this the out. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. Hmm. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. I was totally looking for the gorilla, so I completely missed the curtain. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. People who people who watch the gorilla video tend to have that experience. I had just, so just heard about this in an audio book too. And so I knew to look for the gorilla, but didn't see anything else. <laughs> yep, yep. That's how our brain works. So that that's another that's called the attentional bias. When we pay attention to what is most emotionally salient and we miss really important things. So for example, with a player leaving the game, you might miss an employee disengaging, or you might miss the curtain changing color. You might miss the background context changing. I mean, that's been, let's say, all the stuff with the, the free presidents testifying in front of Congress, missing the context and not realizing how they will look to the rest of the world as a result of that testimony. That's a very obvious miss by very prominent uh, senior leaders. So this is, you can look for the monkey business illusion on on YouTube and you'll find that uh, copy. Actually, I can give you a copy of mine. Hold on. Um, so I put a Dropbox link in the chat and you can just download that video using the Dropbox link. Thank you. And that's a. I find that that's a really good video to for people to um, open their minds to the fact that they're not <laughs> going to be really good at noticing context, which is incredibly important in modern team building and business leadership and people decision making. Other folks. This was very, very insightful. Um, as we're Thank going you. through a really big change right now, and and mm. people's emotions are just all over the place. Mm. Um, some are excited, some are scared, some are just like running for the door, <laughs> some mm. are like embracing the change. So it's really. Um, a lot to you know to be able to process and, and give back to our teams to help them through those changes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I'm glad it's helpful. Yeah, uh, with changes, you need to really be thinking about the fight or flight response and how mm -hmm. that's triggering people. Yep. 
Well, it doesn't seem like there are any more questions. Karen, do you want to close us out? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I'm looking very much forward to um, receiving the your book and being able to read that and review and go even more in depth on this subject. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I look forward to maybe working with you again in the future. Excellent, Karen. Look forward to everyone having a positive experience with my book and the other content. Thank okay. You. Have, have a great day and a, and a wonderful holiday. You too, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, Skip, I'll email you with uh, the resources. Of, but here, let me give it to you. Hey, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Disaster Skip. DisasterAvoidanceExperts.com. Okay, cool. Yep. Thank you, Glad. That was great. That was fun. I'm glad to hear it, Skip.